Good afternoon and welcome to the Family Office webinar. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Najin Amin, CIO of Petiol Asset Management, and I will be your host today. I'm very excited to host this webinar with Johannes Hughes, partner and head of KKR operations in Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. Prior to joining KKR, Johannes was a member of InvestCorp Management Committee and was responsible for the firm's operations in Europe. And he worked also at Salman Brothers, where he was a VP in the M&A department. Johannes holds a Bachelor of Science with the highest honor from the London School of Economics, an MBA from the University of Chicago. Johannes had an incredible journey at KKR. He joined the group in 1999 to the establishment of the European office. The group back then was 30 people and $21 billion under management. Today, fast forward, Johannes is partner, head of EMEA. The group has close to 1,500 employees across the world and more than 200 billion in assets under management. He's a serial entrepreneur investor in Europe and we are glad to be partnering with him on several successful transactions in the past, Alliance Boots, and more recently, LGC. Johannes, many thanks for joining us today from Paris. I understand well, you prepared you. a few slides on, 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 for us on the PE landscape. Uh, I suggest we take 20, 25 minutes uh, just to take, take us through the insights of how you're seeing European private equity today how you and your team are navigating the environment. And then for sure, we want to open it up for questions from the audience so they have a chance to engage with you in topics that they have in mind for uh, private equity in general and Europe in particular. Thank you, Johannes. Good to have you. Thank you very much, Naji. Thanks for this uh, uh, very uh, uh, fulsome introduction. And um, I, I really appreciate it. So first of all, I hope uh, that everybody on this call is, is healthy and safe uh, in these uh, uh, really unsettled times. I, I, I want to start always with that. And uh, I wish you um, uh, continued uh, uh, health and, and safety as, uh, as we battle the uh, COVID crisis globally. Um, so the idea for this was to sort of give you a little bit of an insight as to what we at KKR have done in response to the crisis and what we've seen the private equity market in particular in Europe having done during the crisis. What I want to do is give you a quick sort of overview uh, just to remind everybody what we do at KKR, talk a little bit about the setting in Europe of uh, how COVID has affected the economy and what our economists see and then go a little bit more specifically into what has the private equity market done. So with that, let me kick it off. Um, uh, just a, as a reminder, as, as Naji was saying, we're a global firm um, uh, with the recent acquisition of GA. We now have over 270 billion of assets under management, um, and we cover a lot of different strategies, including private equity, but also infrastructure, real estate, credit, um, and, um, energy. Uh, so uh, a lot of different strategies, all in the alternative space. And we do this on a global basis. We have a big effort in Asia. Obviously, we come from the United States, and we have a big effort in Europe. Within Europe, we're basically active in these, uh, in, in these asset classes. Um, we have a private equity business, which is our biggest business. Um, we have a sort of core, what we call core private equity business, which invests in longer term um, uh, uh, less risky investments. We're in gross equity, so uh, mainly focused on technology. And then we also focused on healthcare. We have two separate funds that focus on these areas um, in the market. We have an impact business, which is concerned with investing in companies with positive ESG criteria. We have a very large infrastructure effort. We have a real estate business. And then on the credit side, we really have three different buckets, one which I would call is more of a liquid credit business, leverage credit business. We have a private credit business, which invests in asset-based lending, some what we used to call mezzanine uh, lending. And then we have a special situations business, which invests in sort of distressed capital solutions, debt for control. But that's what KKR is doing in Europe. You can see the countries in which we have presence here. And um, uh, 
So we're really active in everything KKR does globally, really apart from energy. We're not doing any energy investing in Europe. That we only do in the United States. So that's, that's as much as you're going to hear from me on, uh, on, on the KKR advertising. With that, let me talk a little bit about what we've seen uh, in terms of, uh, of the COVID crisis in Europe. This is quite a busy slide. And what I've tried to do is sort of effectively look at three different parts, which is we have a, had obviously a health crisis, and we still have a health, health crisis, which currently, for example, affects us. I'm happy to be in our office in Paris. That's open. Our London office has much more restricted access. And obviously, right now, we cannot freely travel between London and Paris because there's a quarantine restriction if you come into London. So this is a, 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 the, the effect of the health crisis that affects us personally and um, uh, where we also need to make sure that if I look at my employees, that if they're coming back, they're coming back in a safe manner. So that will continue to affect uh, what happens on the economic basis which is we've seen significant layoffs in a lot of sectors. If you think about the logical ones, obviously restaurants, tourism sector, um, these are all, if, if you want, consumer-facing sectors that have had a significant impact. Um, right now, we have seen the government furlough schemes where people get paid whilst they're temporarily laid off cushion a lot of this impact. It is our view, though, that a lot of those people that are temporarily laid off will not be temporarily laid off. They will actually um, come and stay unemployed. And once the payments that the government has been making start reducing, we will see a, uh, more of a problem. So that's the sort of economic perspective. Against that, you have to set what government has done. And government has put a huge amount of money into the market. There's been significant quantitative easing. We've had all kinds of schemes to uh, uh, try to stimulate the economy. So right now, we basically have two influences. We have what we're seeing in the real economy, which is potentially significant unemployment. And on the other hand, we've seen significant liquidity inserted in the system. And it's difficult to see right now which of those will win. Clearly, what we're seeing in the stock market is we're seeing a reflection of the significant liquidity that has been injected. But there is in the back of our mind the possibility that the unemployment that could happen will offset some of these positive effects. What we've seen, and I've, I've talked about the markets, so obviously markets have been up significantly. Um, uh, high yield, you know, gapped out, but has come back. So performance uh, uh, has been, over the last six months, has been very good in, in that market. And, and we were able to benefit from some of that by buying uh, bonds in the 70s and then being able to sell them in the high 90s. And we've seen volatility, which spiked, but right now has come back to a much more reasonable level. I want to spend one minute on this slide because I think it's very important for Europe. The 750 billion uh, next generation EU fund is really a significant change in Europe because it's the first time that we have effectively something uh, where we have European funding which has been mutualized. So all of the European countries are responsible for it. It's a significant step in the direction of fiscal integration. It's something that Germany, Holland, Finland, these countries have always resisted, but this has been implemented. And I think it's a, a very positive step in Europe issuing debt and Europe having capital to uh, uh, support its economy. Now, what did we do at KKR? So we basically took a view in the middle of April that this crisis was going to be a temporary crisis. And when we looked back at how we behaved in 2007 and 2008, what we've seen there is that we spent all of our time in 2007, 2008 on fixing our portfolio. And we didn't make many new investments. So in the middle of April, the senior management of the firm got together and we said, let's not make this mistake again. Yes, let's have by far the majority of our people make sure that what we have, that our portfolio performs well. We spent a tremendous amount of time monitoring the portfolio, teams that focused on what can we get from the government, how do we make sure that uh, all the latest information are shared amongst the portfolio companies, et cetera. 
But we said, let's use maybe 70% of our horsepower to do that, and let's take 30% to try to invest. And so we've invested significant amounts of capital, as you can see here, almost 30 billion over the, over the firm globally during this period of crisis. And that was on a very deliberate manner. Um, so we really tried to, to some degree, take advantage of this period in making significant investments. And we've made those in traded credit. That was really something that was very easy to do immediately because these credits were liquid, available, and we could buy. We've made that on the equity markets. We took some stakes in public equities. And then we started looking at where do we have some companies that need liquidity? And then where can we make some acquisitions and find companies that we can buy at attractive values? And we spend time on that. So the majority of this investment has happened in the private markets where we found uh, some opportunities. I've listed a few of these examples at the bottom of this slide. Viridor is a waste recycling business that we invested in in the middle in, in March, basically, in the UK, quite a large acquisition that we did. Um, Coty and Vela are two acquisitions that we made in Germany and the US in April. We made an acquisition in um, a public offer for a company called Masmobil, which is a, um, a mobile business in Spain, which again, we launched in April. We made a public offer for a UK, French media business called MediaOne, which we launched in May. We made another public offer in France for a software business called DevoTeam. Again, we launched it in May. Just as an example, we really became proactive, um, uh, and, and the conviction there was that whilst we are in a difficult period, this period is going to be limited. And when we have find a vaccine, we will come out of this and we will have been able to buy some assets at attractive prices. So that's, that's our perspective. Um, with that, let me talk a bit about the market. Um, so there is still significant risk in Europe. Um, a lot of my American colleagues like to point that out, but we currently have a lot of European countries restricting foreign direct investment that's aimed at China primarily. Um, there's a lot more control when you want to buy a European business than what we had in the past. Um, what we're seeing is we're seeing political systems where in Spain we have a minority government with a coalition which has some issues. We have um, a, 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 in Germany a political system where the sort of traditional two-party system is no longer existing. We have 2021 elections coming up. Um, we have in Italy, again, a, a quite unstable situation. So if we look at it from a sort of macro perspective, there are some issues in Europe that we shouldn't forget about. Don't forget what Donald Trump has been trying to do with Europe. He's been trying to lean on Europe by using trade as a tool. That's important for Europe. And there is a risk that Europe gets caught between China and the United States in the trade war that we're currently having. So I think it just, I don't want to make everybody feel like Europe, everything is great. You've made some investment. There's still some potential issues there now, I think we're going to get we're getting paid for some of these issues in terms of returns, but uh, let's not forget about some of the risks. So with that, first of all, um, the market overall took a very different perspective from the per perspective that we took. In other words, most people significantly slowed down their investment during the crisis. And you can see that on the uh, left hand slide, uh, left hand part of the slide. So a significant reduction, almost a halving in terms of the volume of private equity in Europe um, during the crisis. We've also seen quite a change in terms of the uh, type of transaction. So there have been way fewer secondary deals. There have been much more sort of corporate carve-outs where companies, and I think it's, it's really driven by the market that we've been in, companies needed cash. And so we were able, as an industry, to buy more from corporates and also families uh, uh, with companies which maybe had their back a little bit more against the wall where we were able to sell. So from an investor in private equity, I think actually quite a good environment because there's a lot more primary deal flow and high quality primary deal flow that we've seen, but overall volumes down significantly. Uh, in terms honest, of just 
Uh, yeah. You mean, so by secondaries, you mean a private equity selling to another private equity? Yes, Naji, thanks for, for pointing that out. That's exactly. So it's it's one private equity firm selling to another private equity firm. Uh, uh, basically, it's, the, uh, it's, it's what we call a secondary uh, a buyout. And there is much less of that, which I think means the quality is somewhat higher. Um, again, but what, what this slide shows is that people have used this period of COVID to spend more time with their portfolio. So we've seen more add-ons for the existing portfolio companies as a percentage of the mix. Six, so significant increase there. And in terms of new deals, obviously the decrease that I just talked about. But I think it's an important point to make. The type of deal has changed. And then although the carve-out significant declined, we, we are continuing to see conglomerates shedding assets. Now, what happened to pricing? Pricing went up, but, but this is really not due to the fact that people are paying more money, but due to the fact that EBITDA in the companies that were bought have significantly reduced, right? So most of the businesses that we bought, we bought on a significant reduced EBITDA. And so when we look at it, we're looking at saying, okay, we cannot take the earnings of 2020 because that's been affected by COVID. Businesses were shut effectively for three, four months. And therefore, um, uh, uh, we, we basically can't look at those earnings as the earnings that the business will have next year. We sort of see a curve, a V-curve, whereby you know, we, we were running at rate X, COVID hit, earnings come down, and that is what's reflected in this 12.3 times, that we have a much lower base EBITDA. Again, we think that's attractive because we don't think the EBITDA will stay there. We think the EBITDA is going to come back up, and that's quite frankly what we're already seeing in our, our portfolio. EBITDA is starting to pick back up so that when we think what multiple did we actually pay over the earnings that this business can sustain, it's a much more attractive multiple. And that's really the way we thought about it. But in terms of the objective numbers, multiples went up basically because people's EBITDA has come down a lot. And we and some of our colleagues were willing to basically take the risk that this EBITDA will come back next year. So that's, that's sort of what we've seen in the market, significant reduction in volume, as sort of change in the type of deals that people have done. So a lot more primary transactions, much less secondary, uh, really explained by the fact that some of the corporates and some of the families had more pressure to sell because of COVID. And on an absolute basis, higher multiples. But I think if you look at that on a look-through basis, which is the statistics can't do that because you don't know what the projections are of these businesses, these multiples will actually turn out to be quite attractive on a longer term basis. Of course, we've also gotten, um, uh, of course, we've also gotten much less debt in this market. The banks were more afraid, so amount, the absolute amount of leverage that you've been able to get is less, and that's leverage on a much reduced EBITDA because the banks are looking at the reduced EBITDA. So I think it makes for better capitalized businesses on a low EBITDA but you're obviously making the bet that EBITDA is coming back as we come out of the crisis. Um, maybe just two words in terms of the fundraising. So clearly fundraising has been affected by uh, the crisis. We've seen um, much lower volumes being raised and, and really almost the lowest volume over the last 10 years this year. So we've seen a, quite a reduction in terms of fundraising volumes, and we've seen a change in mix as to who's raised money, and it's really been a mix that switched back to buyout. So I would say to more of the traditional larger firms rather than venture capital, gross, fund of fund, secondaries. So I think what we've seen is people have come back to something that's been tried and tested rather than the more riskier areas uh, of, of where funds have been raised. Um, if, if we look at uh, you know performance, um, what's interesting is, and, and these are just the vintage years. In other words, this is when um, uh, uh, when the capital, when the fund was originally raised, not, and and then the return as of today, basically. Uh, and you can see that there is a continuing divergence between the top funds 
and the bottom funds. And that's definitely what we're seeing. We're seeing a, a sort of bifurcation between people that are doing well and people that are not doing so well. So, um, and, 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 you know, clearly, uh, I'm going to finish with that slide. We hope we count as a people uh, that are doing well. Um, our last two funds have been first quartile funds, and um, uh, uh, we've uh, delivered a, a reasonable track record, even in these, uh, in these difficult times. Um, with that, um, uh, I would uh, uh, maybe hand back to uh, Naji. Um, uh, uh, I think you've got one or two points, and then we can start addressing some of the questions. Sure, yeah. Sure, Thank, yeah. You, uh, Thank you. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, yes, 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 any question you have, you have to ask. We have uh, one question from your presentation. Um, you, you showed the LDO purchase prices, uh, if we can uh, look at that again. And I agree in latest con transactions you've done, the PE uh, is higher just because of depressed earnings. But what's interesting is that from 2009 to 2015, we've seen European price uh, purchase price multiples. Haven't that increased much? I mean, we're arranging between nine to 10 times compared to potentially what we have seen, if I'm not mistaken, in the US where the valuation have increased over the years. Um, can you explain and clarify why is this the case in Europe versus the US? Yeah, so we've, I mean, I think we've seen obviously from, from nine times to 11 times is a reasonable expansion. So we've seen some expansion multiples, but you're, you're absolutely correct. In the US, the multiple expansion was much bigger. And, and I, I mean, I think sort of taking a step back, one of the fundamental differences between the US market and the European market is that the US market is much more driven by the public markets. If you look at the sort of number of total companies, the number of companies in Europe that are private is a much, much larger percentage than the number in the US of the, of the companies that are private. So in the US, we are much more driven by the public markets and the multiples therefore are also much more transparent and driven by the public markets. Because so many of these European companies are private, that market is less transparent, less driven by public market comparables, and therefore I think we are seeing much less of a, uh, of a tendency to match what's happening in the public markets and therefore also somewhat slower, um, uh, lower multiples, you know, combined with the fact that the European transactions tend to be more complex. By definition, most of our transactions are multi-jurisdictional, very often multi-currency, and um, in the U.S., it's uh, it's you know it's one big market and therefore simpler and more transparent. Thank you. Um, touching on uh, your uh, Europe as a uh, multicultural place, when you look at your companies during COVID, have you seen any results? Uh, that are differentiated between countries, or have you seen results of companies that are similar between sectors? Yeah, it's it's definitely sector driven. This um, because I mean, look, very simple. We we have a business that's in the travel sector, and that sector has basically been I mean, there's been no business. Uh, people haven't haven't been able to travel, so that company has been significantly affected. Um, uh, 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 by uh, the COVID virus. We own a business in Germany that is a, uh, a company that basically does tax audit, tax returns. So it helps small business to prepare their tax return. COVID, and, and they help them with some small financial advice. So COVID, of course, has increased some of the complexity as people have been trying to apply for the government schemes. This business, we're 20% ahead of budget, right? So, um, it really depends on the sector as to how these companies have performed. And then by sector, it's very similar across all the com countries. It, it is really sector driven and, and you know, certain sectors are just much more adversely affected than others. And some sectors have actually benefited. So, and, and in our portfolio, we see everything um, uh, across that portfolio. Maybe I can just spend one minute on portfolio performance um, the performance of the company, when we set up, when we were in March, we ran all kinds of scenarios from, you know, 
uh, base case, worst case, absolute worst case. And what we've seen is that the companies have actually performed better than our base case that we lined out in March. Now, we're probably, compared to last year, in terms of EBITDA across our whole portfolio, are going to be down somewhere between 5 and 10%. Which is not great, but it's clearly significantly better than what we had feared. So I would say the performance has been, in retrospect, quite solid. You know, we're down, so that's not that's not great, but really not anywhere close as bad as we had feared when when the crisis first hit. And what would you attribute this to? Well, I think the um, I, I think the economy. The, the 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 fact that these governments have made such big efforts in terms of injecting capital into the economy um, has given consumers confidence, and therefore we've seen, you know, some of these businesses come back much quicker than we had thought. Uh, you know, we it's been much more of a V, quite frankly, than a U or an L or all the other letters that we uh, we were thinking about as how this market could behave. It's it's really come back much faster. And um, I, I think it's due to the proactive and fast reaction by the governments in providing capital and giving people confidence. We have a question uh, that I see here. Um, how how the pandemic influence your investment themes that you will be pursuing in the future in Europe? Yeah, it's a it's a super question. So we 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 I mean we we created uh, a whole uh, team to look at exactly that and saying look what is changing what is permanently changing what are some of the sectors that we should look at investing behind and so clearly um, uh, I mean part of the reason we've invested in a in a telecoms business is that we believe there will be more of what we're doing right now right there will be more uh, communicating via Zoom there will be more even if you can go back and travel, this is not going away. And so we think capacity and, and the telco businesses that we've seen have performed really quite well. We think that's going to continue. So that's just one theme that we've invested behind. And like that, we've tried to identify other themes um, as a result of this crisis. Obviously, healthcare is for us a big sector um, where we're trying to invest behind. We've just bought the largest clinic chain in France. Um, uh, those are businesses that we think are, to some degree, benefiting um, uh, from what we're seeing as as, as a crisis, and um, th there will be, I, I think, there's going to be a number of these themes which will continue to be relevant even next year or the year after when we might be out of this crisis because there is a change in people's behavior. One of the themes that uh, KKR has been playing over the years has been uh, called consumer experience, and. Uh, and uh, and it you know it, it goes around the consumer spending more on experience than on staples. Has this theme being uh, revisited in your uh, uh, within your team that you're thinking about going forward? As if you want to reduce that consumer experience yeah. uh, versus the stable and the consumer, we're going to see uh, buying more essentials and less discretionary items. How do you reflect on that consumer behavior? Oh, it's a very good question. So, you know, we part of consumer experiences, we own the largest amusement park in Spain, uh, near Barcelona. And obviously, first of all, the park was shut down. Then we opened very late. And we've probably operated at around 20% of capacity. So you can see that people are afraid to go and, uh, and, and, and visit and, and take advantage of those experiences. Um, and, and so that's something that we have to take into account. On the other hand, uh, with Upfield, we bought a company that sells margarine, um, so definitely a consumer staple, and that business has done very well through the crisis, right? So I think um, I think you're right. There's probably going to be more of a focus on uh, so, and you know we made the investment in in Vela, which is a hair care business again, where where you you can buy. You know, coloring. I'm, I, I don't really need it, but um, where you can buy something to color your hair. But for and and a lot of women bought this product because it's, it's for home use. So you know, you, where you can color your hair without going to the hairdresser. And and so those those things have uh, have definitely increased in use. And again, for those categories, we believe that that's something that's going to certainly continue for some time. It's that we won't see an immediate snapback 
um, uh, uh, we, we, will, we think we will see a continued increased home use of some of these products. So yes, I think we're, we're, it's a shift a little bit more um, to, the, um, uh, 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 to the staple side. There's one more question here. Um, what do you see? I mean, you, you cover and you talk to many CEOs uh, of your underlying companies and what is on top of mind of uh, European CEOs today? So, I, th I mean, it's, it's shifted. I would say, first of all, in uh, March, April, May, everybody was just focused on, on you know, it was disaster response. Let's make sure the business stays alive. Let's fix it. All ends to the boat. Um, and, uh, and, and, and very much focused on the near term. Right now, I think people are asking exactly the question that you asked me two questions ago, which is, what is going to be the long-term effect of what we've just seen? This, this will have a significant change, societal change. And what is that effect? And what is that effect going to be on my business? And I think people are very much focused on that. And, and a lot of the CEOs are asking themselves that, you know, longer term, what does this change mean for me and for my business? That, that's really right now where I see the focus. Most people have seen the business coming back, so it's in a much better shape than it's been, but it's not, you know, it's still obviously not where it was before COVID. And now they're trying to find answers in terms of how can they grow, what do they see as to how the business is, uh, is going to do going forward. Great. Um... Honey, I see a question on tourism. And by the way, I excuse myself for the noise in the background, but we, we don't have super luxurious offices and I'm, in, uh, I'm sitting in, above a construction site. So uh, hopefully this will go away because it's France and it's uh, almost six o'clock and they'll stop working. Um, but, but I think there was a question on the tourism sector. Yes, please. And, how, how has, has that been affected? I think the tourism sector is probably one of the hardest hit sectors that we've seen. We own some hotels in France and in the Balearic Islands. They're all still closed. You know, we opened some of these hotels in Spain at, at one point, um, but then when the UK put quarantine on travel from Spain, we really had to close those hotels. The UK, which provides a lot of the travelers to you know, France and Spain, Basically, people haven't traveled because of the quarantine issues. So that sector has been significantly affected, and we've basically seen a consistent push out as to when it's going to come back. You know, we thought it will come back in September, and now maybe it's December, now it's next year. So it really is, I think it's, it's one of the most, it's, it's one of the significant, most significant affected sectors. Aviation, of course, as well, goes hand in hand with tourism. So these sectors are, are, have been, really, really badly affected, and I think it will take them some time to come back. Um, there's a question on uh, European PE performance versus US PE post-COVID. Um, I think also maybe what we have seen in European PE performance relative to public market, uh, and you showed that need in return. Uh, I mean, investors who invested in European private equity have maybe outperform on average 7% the European public equity over the years, no matter which vintage, uh, which is also a larger outperformance, for example, uh, compared to a U.S. investor who invested in U.S. private equity compared to U.S. public equity. The question is, how, how do you see that going forward post-COVID between European private equity and U.S. private equity? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I think it's too early to tell the difference right now. We, we don't see. What, what we've seen is that the U.S. market, um, our, I mean, was much slower. So we have seen, I mean, if you look at this volume trend, it was even worse in the U.S. Uh, in terms of volume reduction. And it's remained that way while Europe has already come back a little bit. U.S. really still hasn't come back. Um, so in terms of new deals, there, there's been a slowdown. In terms of performance of the companies, I would say there hasn't, when we look at our US portfolio, Europe portfolio, Asia portfolio, we haven't seen such a huge difference. I would say Asia has definitely um, uh, been the least affected because we've seen China and some of these countries come back much quicker. But between Europe and the US, 
maybe Europe, maybe the US is a little bit behind Europe, but I wouldn't, I think it's too early to say that, that I could make a sort of a confident prediction on the basis of that. Um, I do, however, think this return differential will remain because I, I just think it's structural and it has more to do with the number of public versus private companies than just the, um, uh, that, you know, than, 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 than just how are the companies doing today. So I think that there is a structural difference which explains some of that uh, return differential. Um, your pace of investment this year, um, how does it compare to previous years um, and same time last year? Another question uh, from the audience. Yeah, we've invested significantly more. It's probably double what we did last year in that same period. Uh, when you think about your performance, what would you say are the repeatable uh, process that you've put in place that, uh, to deliver on this performance consistently? And, and shed some light on, you know, I mean, you've been in the market for many, many years in Europe. So some of the best practices that you've seen investing as an investor in European private equity and private companies. Well, look, it's, it, I mean, I think it's constantly evolving. Uh, you know, every, every year we learn more. We, we try to improve what we're doing. Um, uh, uh, obviously, the, uh, I think the focus that we and a lot of our competitors have right now is how do we work with the portfolio to improve the portfolio companies while, while we own them. And we really believe that that's where we make a difference in creating returns. So we've got big teams of people that are focused on operations. Um, we have a sort of centralized effort that's based in, in, on the West Coast in the U.S. that focused on digitalization. And we, they, they have people of that team in, in Europe and in Asia um, that, that basically look at what's a digital threat to the businesses that we own. How can we make them face those threats better? How can we get them a leg up? So quite a lot of effort goes into that. Um, uh, we, we have, you know, specialists in purchasing, specialists in customer relationship management that work with our portfolio companies to try to improve their performance and therefore make them better businesses and in the end create more returns for us when we sell them. So all the effort really goes into that. We clearly try to improve how we select businesses, but that's, I would say, that's fine tuning. You know, we've, we've, we have good investors. We've always had good investors. We are using new tools as to how we evaluate companies. We're, you know, using, we're scrapping websites. We're, we're using um, large scale satellite imaging to look at, you know, how uh, people flows. We're, we're trying to pull on other newer data sources to basically uh, evaluate companies better. But the judgment I think is still experience and, and, and um, uh, we, we have a large group of experienced investors, but really a lot of effort has gone into this how do we work with our portfolio companies when we own them and how do we make sure that we create value while we own these businesses so that's that's been where the main focus has been and i think that's not just for kkr it's it's really for 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 a lot of our competitors as well johannes um, i'm sure you you have had some difficult deals and uh, over over your lifetime and nothing uh, goes up and uh, what has been some of the lessons learned that you can uh, talk about and share with us on, uh, on investing in European companies? Yeah, I, I mean, so, so there's, if, if you know, there, there's some mistakes where we basically bought businesses that were in sectors where effectively government regulations started to affect us adversely. And so for sure, I now have a, a huge aversion to invest in anything where the government uh, could influence um, uh, you in a in a in a significant way. So regulated tr businesses are something that we're nervous about because from one day to the next, the government can really change your business model. Um, that that's I think I think is one takeaway. The other takeaway is I think sometimes we've just been um, we, we've been too lenient with underperforming management teams. Um, so we've, you know, let's give the guy another chance. Let's wait and see how he's doing. Instead of when we really knew uh, in, in our heart of hearts that uh, we need to change it, it's taken us a long time sometimes to make those changes. 
then when you make those changes, you always know that you should have made the change maybe 12 to 24 months earlier. So I think being a little bit um, more consequent when uh, uh, being confronted with poor performance is something that, uh, that we've definitely learned. And that's something that we've tried to institutionalize by having a, a, a sort of committee of experienced managers that every one of our portfolio companies will come to at least twice a year and they see those managements. And if the management team isn't good, we're now becoming much more consequent in, in making changes. So may, these are maybe two, two different uh, perspectives of, of learnings from, uh, from some of the mistakes in the past. Great, thank you. Um, speaking about growth investments, uh, uh, recently you've been uh, also pursuing some growth investments. When we look at valuation uh, dispersion between value and growth, it is at a historical high. Are you going to change your approach pursuing those sectors uh, or slowing down these growth investments that you are pursuing to go into more the value play? So I would say the two answers. First of all, we have a separate fund. We have a separate fund which is just focused on these growth investments, which is a tech-focused fund. It's focused on the growth investments. Most of the people that are running the fund are maybe half my age. So uh, I, I, I tend to, I'm more probably of a value investor, but they've made some super successful investments, which quite frankly have had very good outcomes. So I, I, you know, can I predict if there is a bubble or if this bubble will break? You know, I, quite frankly, I don't know. I think technology clearly has a sort of secular wind behind it. Um, I think there is right now so much liquidity in the market that it's, it's hard for me to see what's, what's going to stop this. So I think our growth fund will definitely continue to do this in that fund. But people know the risks that they're taking when they invest in that fund. In our private equity fund, we're switching much more to value investing from growth investing. That's for sure. We're getting a lot of questions, so I'm going to try to address them uh, all. Um, one question on the EU has agreed to pursue a green recovery. Do you think that sustainable and green business and investment will be the norm? Have you seen demand rise in this space? Yeah, so I, I think absolutely the green deal, as they call it, is, is, is a big deal. Um, and the EU is not, this isn't going to go away. This is something that Ursula von der Leyen has, has set as one of her core pillars of her agenda for the next five years. So we know for sure we'll have this for five years. And they're going to change legislation. They're going to change regulation to drive this. So um, uh, we are absolute. We've got a working group across our impact fund, across our PE fund, to really evaluate this. What impact this is going to have on our portfolio, and what businesses can we invest behind to take advantage of how this is going to change. But I, I think that will be a significant driver of what we're going to do in the future. You know, it's sort of getting swamped a little bit by everything that's happening with COVID. But um, I, I think it's going to be a very, very important fact going forward. And do you see that theme being the main differentiator between Europe and the rest of the world? I, I, well, if Donald Trump stays president of the United States, I can't see the U.S. Uh, having a similar Green Deal. Um, and um, I, I do think China is trying to move in the same direction. Certainly they say they are. They haven't really proven it yet in terms of what they've done. But um, uh, I, I definitely think Europe is going to continue to be the leader in that area. Uh, not a private equity question, but uh, more on the real estate. I'm sure you have a view on the future of office space and commercial real estate. Yeah, I think it's, it's a good question. Um, we, we definitely think that this is um, – so our real estate team right now is not investing in, in offices and, and is uh, spending much more time in the logistics space, which obviously is benefiting from you know, people ordering more uh, uh, over the Internet. Um, and I, I, I do think that we will see a permanent change in how people behave. I, I see it in our own businesses. I, I don't think everybody will feel that being in the office five days a week or six days a week is the way to live. I think people will maybe be in the office three days a week and one or two days work from home. Um, and that's going to have some impact on the requirement for office space. Um, you know, we're, we're seeing when I look at the investment banks in London, um, as a result of the uh, uh, crisis, they are moving 
what what they've learned is that you know there was always the thing no you can't move tech t tech teams out of the core um office well the tech teams have been working out of the core office perfectly fine and the businesses have been continuing to work so these teams will no longer be sitting in canary wharf these teams will be sitting in krakow or in budapest or somewhere else they don't need to sit there because it's much cheaper and you get as good quality people. So I think we are going to see in, in, in some of the uh, sort of core cities, um, maybe uh, maybe a little softer, uh, softer market as regards office and commercial. Great. Johannes, uh, we're at uh, 45 minutes. We promised uh, to keep it uh, 40, 45. And I know your uh, German blood uh, says time is, in, is of essence. <laughs> so, uh, I have to wrap it up here. I'm sorry we couldn't address all the questions. Um, before I uh, I give you uh, maybe if you wish uh, some uh, remarks, last remarks. Um, uh, I would I just want to uh, mention that uh, Hani Abu Ali, who uh, CEO of Petrol Asset Management, he was supposed to uh, host this call. I covered for him. He had to uh, be absent and apologized for not being there, hosting the, this webinar with you, Johannes. He had to attend uh, some personal matters. Unfortunately, his dad is not feeling well, and uh, we pray for him and his family. Um, with this, uh, Johannes, maybe last remarks on your side, and uh, we try to wrap it up here. Uh, I, I really just want to thank you. I want to thank Abdul Mohsen uh, uh, for giving me a, a chance to speak. Um, uh, I, I think uh, uh, the uh, family office is, is really a fabulous institution uh, that you all have built. Uh, and uh, uh, we at KKR are really delighted to be associated with you. Um, uh, as, as I said in the beginning, I wish everybody uh, uh, health uh, and uh, stay safe. Thank you very much, uh, really, for listening to me. Thank you, Hannes. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.